Mm -hmm. uh, many people in research, if you put them on a keto diet, they'll start losing fat even if you try to make them gain weight. Or 75% of glycogen was resynthesized within six hours after a strength training workout. And oh, that's fasted. That's without no any, any dietary intake, exactly. The training volumes actually needed to make those carbohydrates necessary. You do not encounter those with strength training. Your body has the building blocks. If you give it protein and it, it can take the fat, it can build muscle mass, as long as the training program and everything is stimulating that process. If you're talking about an obese individual, they need to lose fat yesterday. So anything you do that gets them to lose fat will improve their health. And people have this idea that dieting is unhealthy or whatnot. Any biomarker you look at will improve with fat loss. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body, Mind and Forum podcast. I'm your host, Seem Lund, and our guest today is Menno Henselmans. Menno is an online PC coach, researcher, and entrepreneur who founded the Bayesian Bodybuilding website. Bayesian Bodybuilding is an evidence based approach to fitness that looks at the current data and forms the most reasonable course of action based on that. Menno, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Good to be here. Yeah, nice to see you. And uh, I've seen a lot of, you know, awesome uh, podcasts and different uh, YouTube videos about your work as well. And uh, I'm uh, glad to have you on the podcast. Cool, so, nice. So did I, did I get like the definition of Bayesian bodybuilding right uh, What with mm -hmm. the intro? Yep, yeah. The problem with uh, uh, the Bayesian bodybuilding that I found it and you explained it well is that it's a nice concept, but for most people, and like you say, even uh, podcast hosts that people have, I listen to many of my other podcasts. Uh, it's Beijing is still, you know, a lot of people are like, is that a country in Europe? <laughs> so it doesn't really um, uh, resonate. It's like the 0.1% the of the population is like, oh, that's awesome. And then most people are just like, huh? Yeah. And bodybuilding is also something that to a lot of people are like, okay, he just calls it bodybuilding, uh, which for me is what it is, muscle growth, fat loss. You know, some people want it to the extent that they can go on stage. Uh, but a lot of people, they, want to just look good naked, do it for recreational purposes, but it's the same principles that apply. Muscle growth, fat loss, they call it getting toned or whatever, but it's the same things just to a different magnitude. So I, I, I like that, but it still, it scares off a lot of people and that um, makes it so that you, you cannot help as many people as you want. Mm. So um, I'm just going back to uh, Mel Hansemans, basically ditching the brand altogether. Okay. Uh, this, at some point, I've uh, actually been brainstorming about names and stuff and uh, my girlfriend actually said at some point why do you even need a brand and then i thought yeah yeah why do i even need a brand i don't need a brand i just use my own name yeah for sure <laughs> it is like in, in a sense that uh, people tend to associate your work with your name already so it's like easier in a yeah. sense and it's more exactly. more it's more liberating in a sense as well with, with my own like from my own personal experience that um if, if you don't confine yourself with you know the realm of Bayesian bodybuilding, then you can have like more freedom with the content you produce as well. And uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. But uh, what I do like about uh, your work so far and research is like that you're very evidence based and uh, you do it like in a very scientifically uh, way of thinking. And uh, you know, you don't make these rapid uh, conclusions preemptively like a lot of people tend to do. So, so mm -hmm. like a lot of people that tend to jump on different uh, trends and cutting edge strategies for burning fat and building muscle or whatever it is without knowing like actual the full story. So let's maybe start off with some of the biggest fads of uh, let's say the year 2018 that you have come across so far. Um, latest fads, I mean, a lot of things there's, there's truth in there. Um, I'm not even sure if I call it a fat, like CBD is really uh, mm. getting popular right now. Mm. And uh, you know, there, there's something there. Um, people just swing in the direction of, of, you know, cannabis is bad, marijuana is evil, and everyone that uses it should be incarcerated. And then they swing to the other direction, like this is some magical herb that if you take it, it will uh, cure epilepsy and it will mm. make you sleep better than ever. <laughs> and uh, everything, it does everything. So, mm. um, there, it's just something that has applications. It's a strong uh, anti-exulytic, 
I think so. It, it helps reduce anxiety and uh, it can help sleep mainly via that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I'm I'm very unconvinced that it, it does much. So in that sense, um, not a fan. Um, other trends, maybe not really 2018, but uh, there's still a strong trend of uh, exogenous ketones, which I'm not really a fan of. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm, you could say I'm a fan of ketogenic dieting, but not really of uh, doing it with supplements. I think right. if you go keto, just do it with dietary means and don't rely on the supplements. Um, there's actually research showing that they can hurt performance. So the idea is that you get the best of both worlds. You get glucose and ketones as substrates for energy, but it seems that the body's not very well equipped to handle both at the same time, which makes sense from a physiological point of view. Uh, it hasn't adapted ever to using both efficiently at the same time. So it seems it can actually hurt performance. Uh, it's been studied for uh, cognitive performance, doesn't do anything. Uh, the only promise it might have, I think, is appetite suppression. And that could be promising, but you do have to factor in that it has calories. So a lot of people think it's sort of, um, it, it's for fat loss. So they think, yeah, so with a lot of fat burners and the like, and any fat loss food, um, if it has calories, then it has to be worth its calories and be so appetite suppressing that it suppresses energy intake, not just um, equating what you consumed, but also making it so that if you don't track your macros, you end up with even lower energy intake than you otherwise would. Mm -hmm. Then it can be you know, legitimately used for fat loss. A lot of people just get the impression you consume, the more you consume of it, the leaner you get, but it still has calories. So it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Like both with CBD and exogenous ketones that uh, I don't really notice a big difference when taking either of them. And uh, I would imagine that they would work only if people had, if their, if their diet wouldn't be optimized and they would then maybe they would get some sort of benefit. Like if they have like high levels of inflammation or uh, if they're not even doing the keto diets, but you mentioned that you are a fan of like low carb keto. So uh, what do you think about it? And in, what's the best, you know, application for, for, for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of known as a keto guy in the, in the bodybuilding circles because um, not because uh, I guess I'd say a minority of my clients are actually on ketogenic diets, but uh, in contrast to like mainstream bodybuilding, who is vehemently um, high carb and low fat, um, they're all proponents of super high carb dieting. And they have the idea that if you go low carb, you cannot perform in the gym and you get all these ales and whatnot. And fat is what makes you fat. <laughs> so in contrast to that, I'm like very pro keto, but I think it's mostly it's a tool. It's certainly not suitable for everyone. Some, a lot of people just cannot stick to it. Mm. A lot of people cannot stick to it because they don't know how to do it well. But there are also a lot of people that just don't respond that well to ketosis or they just don't need it. They get the mm. same results with or without it. Uh, I probably fall in that category. Uh, I do well in ketosis. I notice no detrimental effects on performance in the gym. Even with very, very low carb intakes, like 30 gram net carbs per day. Mm. Uh, some people would go even lower. Um, I think in general... Uh, you don't have to go lower than you need to to feel well, but uh, as long as you're actually in ketosis. So for me, I think for a lot of people, it doesn't make that much difference. It's mostly personal preference. And if you respond well to the appetite suppressing effect, because that is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, many people in research, if you put them on a keto diet, they'll start losing fat even if you try to make them gain weight. There's actually a recent study about that, but they uh, had people and they were supposedly in energy surplus and trying to gain mass but they ended up losing fat. And then the researchers concluded that a ketogenic diet is inefficient for muscle growth. Uh, and no, it was just, it was so good for fat loss, basically, that it, it suppressed their appetite and they ended up with very low calorie intake. They ended up losing fat instead of uh, bulking. Right. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting that uh, it was like, uh, yeah, yeah the, the, the reason they didn't build muscle was that they simply under eat and subconsciously. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I totally agree that yeah, keto is like amazing for some people who are able to make it work and it's really context dependent. So it may not be, you know, the best, best diet for purely muscle mass, uh, comparing something to like a high carb diet, but it still has like a, it, it, it has its benefits and I would say that in terms of like lean bulking and such then it can actually be really really effective that you won't gain that much fat and uh, you, you can you can still maintain like consistently uh, your physical performance at the gym as well mm -hmm. yeah we have a review in uh, uh, currently in the works that should be uh, submitted 
reasonably soon uh, about the effects of carbohydrate intake on performance. And I think a lot of the, the anti-keto crowd and like uh, are going to be uh, disappointed because the, the main finding of the review is actually that you can go very, very low carb indeed as mm -hmm. long as you uh, do it consistently because the glycogen expenditure, that's the usual uh, mechanism by people say you need a high carb intake because you need glycogen stores to be high. Well, it's even very heavy duty workouts with high volume for a single muscle group. You're talking about 20, maybe 40% depletion. 40% is the highest level that is found in research. Mm. And then you're talking about bodybuilders doing super high volume. Usually it's still like 20% depletion in women, sometimes considerably less even. And that resynthesizes within 24 hours under most circumstances. Um, you have uh, the Cori cycle, the Krebs cycle. The body can use that uh, quite efficiently to still produce um, uh, glucose and thereby glycogen, even when there is a very low supply of dietary carbohydrates. Um, and uh, the glycerol backbone of triglycerides, of fat, can also be converted to glucose. And there is the uh, not so desirable pathway uh, of uh, amino acids that can be used for glucose production. Uh, that would be a last uh, resort, ideally, if you have sufficient protein intake. Uh, it should only happen if your protein intake is excessive in the first place. So I don't think it's a, it's a major concern. The, um, there was actually a study by Pasco et al., which is really old already, but it, it, ne it never really um, went mainstream. It found that 60 or 75% of glycogen was resynthesized within six hours after a strength training workout. Wow. And oh, that's fasted. That's without no any, any dietary intake. Exactly. So the body's actually quite efficient, basically, at... I'm usually over, oversimplifying this, but it effectively recycles lactate mm -hmm. to um, get new glucose. So the, the body's re really efficient in that sense. And I think that it's just, you know, there is a theoretical concern uh, for high carb intakes. It's just the training volumes actually needed to make those carbohydrates necessary. You do not encounter those with strength training. Mm -hmm. Now, endurance training, um, or especially mixed, like, um, concurrent training like team sports that's mostly anaerobic um, but also very high volume and mostly concentric only um, like soccer those kind of sports uh, rugby American football actually has too long rest intervals so it may not apply but uh, mm -hmm. tennis for sure those sports actually they're like right in the sweet spot uh, for massive carbohydrate utilization where a ketogenic diet is likely to be uh, somewhat detrimental mm -hmm. pure strength training and like ultra endurance training they probably don't suffer at all from a ketogenic diet. So I actually think that for most people, a ketogenic diet won't impair muscle growth at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true that uh, you don't even need to work out that hard uh, in a sense to, to, to uh, promote muscle growth or to stay or to get stronger. You can, you can do it very safely uh, with, within these rep ranges that, that can be achievable with a keto diet and like a low carb intake. And it's, it's also yeah, quite amazing of how the body is able to literally take its own body fat and uh, convert it to the exact fuel it needs, even if you have done like resistance training and you haven't eaten anything. So part of it may have to do with that you're actually taking your own body fat and uh, converting it into muscle glycogen and using it to replenish it. For instance, like if you were to exercise and uh, you stay fasted after the exercise, then, then your muscle glycogen would be replenished with your body fat uh, with, if, you, if you stay to continue to fast. Um, to, to some extent, but um, it would only be the, the glycerol. Mm. Um, it's, it's not going to be super efficient. It's mostly going to be the recycled lactate probably, um, but it will resynthesize quite a lot. Mm. Um, so you can definitely, you have... Um, just based on the 20% the, the figure of glycogen depletion, you, you'd have about five workouts in you, even if you were uh, completely fasted, not eating anything. So you basically have like five potentially good workouts in you without any energy intake. Mm -hmm. Now, not going to be optimal for muscle growth for sure, <laughs> but purely from a performance uh, point of view, um, it's, it's, it's doable. Mm -hmm. I think definitely if you compare that to the idea that a lot of people have, like if, if they miss uh, the 100 gram carb pre workout, they cannot perform in the gym. That's just ludicrous. That's like 100% nocebo effect it's in the yeah. brain. It's actually research about that. That if you have people, um, you tell them different amounts of carbohydrates intake, or you give them placebo so they don't know if they consumed carbs or not and uh, how many carbs. Even a study 
with a complete placebo breakfast, I think they use special gels, they can modify and then uh, you have the idea that you're consuming food, but it's actually, it's, it's nothing, it's just like water and flavoring. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had usually detrimental effects um, of usually, they had detrimental effects of uh, not having had breakfast in that situation, even though the other group was not having breakfast either. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it's even a computer placebo breakfast uh, can, can promote performance just because people have this idea that they need the carbs. Yeah, it's it's like yeah, the, the the best performance enhancing supplement is placebo, <laughs> and uh, having your mindset yeah. on point and uh, not being influenced by the idea that you need carbs. And a lot of it has to do with you know, like the psychological belief system that has been enforced by the mainstream fitness industry of yeah, you need to eat you know six small meals a day, high protein, high carb all the time. And if you do uh, miss your post workout shake, then you're gonna lose the gains and miss the anabolic window as well. And <laughs> You're going to lose all your <laughs> games. Uh, placebo effects are so underrated. Uh, I still think it's, it's actually mind boggling how um, a placebo effect can do things like decrease or increase, increase your blood pressure and actually have physiological effects in the body. Um, one of the coolest study, I think, uh, coolest studies that has, has pretty much ever been done is a study in, I think, the 90s or the 80s when this was still considered ethical. Uh, they gave people placebo steroids and uh, I think the other group did actually have uh, take steroids, but at pretty low dosage, but still. And the placebo group actually made um, so much better gains that was better than what you'd expect from that dosage in other research. But the placebo effect was actually stronger than the actual effect that dosage of steroids has in other research. Wow. Like you could see like in the, in the trend, they made like barely any progress and then they were taking the placebo steroids, so fake gear, mm -hmm. and their the gains just skyrocketed. I think they gained like 20% strength in a, in a couple of weeks on all their power lifts. It was uh, really, really astounding. Yeah. So, so it, it, part of it may have to do as well that if you are taking steroids, then you're kind of expecting the steroids to be magical and uh, naturally going to increase your muscle growth without actually lifting heavy weights. So, you, so, so with the placebo, you would aim for lifting heavier. And uh, if you, if you yes. take steroids, then you're kind of holding yourself back just because you, you, you think you're under gear. Yeah, I think a lot of people will just train much harder when they are they are on steroids. Mm. Uh, there's actually a lot of effects because there's also research on the, the effects on moods and cognition of uh, at least testosterone. We don't have that on other uh, steroids, but they're probably similar. Androgenic anabolic steroids are all pretty similar to testosterone, and they found that in research there's actually no effect on mood and cognition. So mm. the common question uh, is like, how does it feel to be on steroids? Well, apparently you don't feel anything. Like there's just you know there's a placebo effect. Because if you Look at online forums. There are people like, "How does it feel to be on steroids?" It's like it's like you could tackle a bus, <laughs> and you know that's that's probably 100% just an, an idea yeah, that you right. have. And if you feel like that, you know, yeah. you're, you're beast mode in the gym, you're gonna just train much harder, get better results. Yeah. Maybe probably stick to your diet better and stuff as well. Yeah, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, completely, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of your articles uh, that I read on your website uh, mentioned uh, about how it is possible to build muscle and burn fat at the same time. And uh, a lot of people say it's that physiologically it's impossible, but uh, your article kind of refuted that. Can, so is it possible? And can you talk about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely possible. So the, the misconception that people have is they basically state uh, it's, it's a misconception about thermodynamics, the loss of energy balance. They think you need to be in energy deficit. Um, to lose mass, you need to be an energy surplus to gain mass, but calories and mass are not the same thing. Um, you need to be an energy deficit to lose bodily energy, and you need to be an energy surplus to store bodily energy, but that energy can come from different departments in the body. So you can be an energy deficit, lose a total net energy from the body, but that all comes from fat, and at the same time, you can be building and storing energy in the form of muscle mass. As long as the total sum is negative, which is quite easy because fat has so many more calories um, than uh, muscle per, um, per kilogram or a gram, um, just the density. So um, it, it's, it's very doable. Even in a one-to-one -one ratio, you'll still end up in very steep energy deficit if you lose one kilo of fat and build one kilo of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll end up in energy deficit, but your weight will actually be stable. And I see this with a lot of clients. It's actually, some people say this is like, a, it's like a theoretical um, concern. It's, it's really, really not. If you do things well for most trainees, like novice intermediate trainees, I'm not talking about like elite level bodybuilders. 
Um, but just most people, uh, and even people that have been lifting for quite a few years, uh, in my experience, just because they haven't optimized everything, they can maintain a stable weight during at least the first weeks of my coaching. It's like one to two months. After that, it gets very hard for most people. But they can maintain their weight, lose a lot of fat, and because they're building muscle at the same rate as they're losing fat. And there are tons of studies showing this. It's not just like me, my clients promoting um, what I do. It is like it's in so many studies you see this. And it's also not only in studies on untrained people or novices or the elderly. Um, there's stuff on Olympic athletes. There's actually a study on um, female bikini figure and body fitness competitors, which found that some competitors, you know, the average wasn't recomposition, but some competitors achieved body recomposition during contest prep. So at the bottom end of body fat levels and quite, you know, advanced trainees. Uh, <laughs> bikini, it doesn't have to be advanced these days, you know, but uh, still they were seriously training. <laughs> and um, rugby players, like very strong guys. Um, elite gymnasts, no, they weren't super strength trained. Some elite athletes also not super strength trained, but still, you know, hard training people, mm -hmm. military personnel. So it's it, people yeah. that say it cannot be done have simply, they have never had good results themselves or with clients. And they obviously do not need scientific literature because mm -hmm. the evidence is, is all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that one study as well from from like these uh, gymnasts who were put on low carb keto and uh, they, they got stronger, they burned body fat and they increased their lean body mass. So <laughs> it, it yeah. comes to show that it is yeah, truly possible even in people who are exercising a lot more than uh, regular regular people. And part of it has yeah. to do with also like the macronutrient ratios have to be quite on point as well in terms of you won't be able to do it with the standard American diet macros, you, you will in that case you would actually you know lose muscle and gain fat at a, at yeah. a deficit potentially. So the mac what would be like more optimal macros for this kind of a very lean body recomposition? Yeah, high protein diet is essential. So we've I'm not as a low protein guy because one of my first articles was um, basically debunking the myth that you need a gram of protein per pound of body weight, mm -hmm. and I showed that this actually in the literature and it's still true today after a lot of research and there's no benefit in nutrient timing controlled settings. So you have the same meals at the same time of day. You just have the total daily protein intake that differs between groups. We have, I think 40 studies on this, well over 20 and they all found no benefit, no statistically significant benefit at least of a higher protein than 1.6 gram per kilogram per day total body weight, which is um, 0.72 gram per pound, I think. Mm. Um, compared to um, going way higher. So um, based on that research, um, I've co-authored a meta-analysis with some of the brightest minds, I think, in evidence-based fitness. Um, Stuart Phillips, uh, that was um, the McMaster University, they did most of the grunt work. Uh, we just did some reviewing and uh, look at the design and make suggestions. They definitely did the grunt work, so I can't take credit there. Uh, but it was a huge project, and we basically meta-analyzed all the literature uh, it was restricted to mostly supplements, though, uh, but that's because it's easier to control uh, protein intakes because people aren't super adherent often in research. And if you just give them whey protein, they can, you know, they can um, get themselves to do that. But it's more difficult to have them eat more steak or whatnot, mm. especially if the whey is free, which it usually is in research. Mm -hmm. um, so that metamask has confirmed no benefits. The, the breakoff point was 1.6 gram per kilogram per day protein of total body weight. Um, so. That's basically as much as most people will likely need. I recommend 1.8, which includes uh, a double standard deviation based on Lemon's research in the 90s. Still holds true today. Uh, that should mean that you cover also the, you know, the, the special snowflakes among us that have uh, super high protein requirements for some reason, uh, digestion or whatnot. Uh, and they um, therefore need more protein. It's mostly theoretical, but they, they probably exist. So. Uh, if you make sure that you have that, those are the key components. You have a good strength training program, high protein intake. You know, there are nutrient timing and all these things. But purely from a physiological perspective, what does the body actually need to um, build muscle mass in energy deficit? Well, it needs to get energy from somewhere. Well, it has tons of body fat. So many people think that I'm getting pretty lean. I don't have much energy anymore. Well, it's about uh, eight, eight to 9,000 calories per kilogram of fat, and even in contest shape, most men still have like five kilo fats. So we're talking about easily 50K calories, yeah. uh, or 50,000 kilocalories, it would be. Yeah. 
to of um, which would be kilos and kilos of muscle mass they can still build with that body fat as long as they also get the protein and there's a few other things water and stuff well that's never a problem uh, and other components that are most likely in the food you eat anyway mm-hmm. so you your body has the building blocks it just okay. if you give it protein uh, and it, it can take the fat it can build muscle mass as long as the, the training program and everything is stimulating that process mm. yeah and probably like uh uh, being more keto adapted would also be beneficial in terms of that you would uh, get, get better access to that body fat, you know, because, you know, like you said, there's a ton of energy stored on the adipose tissue, but a lot of people still don't get access to it or they experience, let's say, like a muscle loss, even if they have excess body fat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might. Um, research is a bit still contentious about whether uh, keto can enhance fat loss. There's two studies uh, that show it's true. Most find it's neutral. Um, and one of the studies was by Jacob Wilson, which is, has been strongly contested as, uh, for data frauding. So that's uh, iffy. And there's one study, uh, but it was on only five subjects or so. Um, so and it, um, but it was actually legit, uh, probably. And it had five measures of muscle or fat loss. So mm. it, it suggested. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced, but it's certainly uh, ke- being keto adapted is going to be positive for sure. So if you're not keto adapted, it would be like more muscle sparing in a sense. That uh, yeah, the the one that small study found the increased uh, nitrogen balance, hmm. which would be uh, which would lend support to the idea of protein sparing. At first, if you're getting keto adapted, there's actually good research uh, in metabolic world conditions that shows you go into negative. Uh, protein balance. So that's bad news. When you're getting it, when you're getting through the keto adaptation period, you may actually be more at risk of muscle loss. But then the weeks afterwards, that's also what that small study at least found. I think it was after six or eight weeks or so, then nitrogen balance turned positive again, mm. and it actually became more positive than the control group. So it might be there is something there that uh, it's protein sparing, and it might actually also decrease protein requirements a bit, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. so that you can recomp more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, it, the body kind of needs some time to get used to it and adapt. But uh, um, what about if someone is like really obese and has like 50 to 100 pounds of extra weight? Uh, would they be still, you know, able to build muscle and burn fat at a, at a huge deficit, even like, and, uh, like uh, training fasted almost? Training fasted is going to be hard um, mm-hmm. because you, you need, you need uh, exogenous ketones or protein basically mm. so there needs to be protein from somewhere otherwise the body will uh, just be breaking down <clears throat> protein at some point of its body to fuel muscle growth in another because the protein needs to come from somewhere um, but you don't have to be too precise with the timing probably especially an untrained individual obese they're gonna have a very easy time actually with body recomposition and they can crash diet very hard I think um, I'm not a huge fan of pure fasting. I like to use protein sparing modified fasts, mm-hmm. which is basically fasting, but you get your protein and essential nutrients in. So it, it's make sure that you're, you're covering the you know, health basis um, and uh, you don't get deficient in vitamin C and the like, and you get protein in. Mm-hmm. So I'm a huge fan of that. Um, and for obese individuals, I think uh, my methods are sort of known as being very, very aggressive for obese and overweight individuals. I think many people are way too conservative i mean if you're talking about an obese individual they need to lose fat yesterday so anything you do that gets them to lose fat will improve their health many people have this idea that dieting is unhealthy or whatnot mm-hmm. any biomarker you look at will improve with fat loss in an obese person even in an obese person if you look at insulin sensitivity risk of thrombosis uh, blood pressure just name any biomarker that you can study and look at someone's health it will improve cholesterol levels, triglycerides, anything, it will all improve with fat loss, even if you have a really crappy diet. There's, a, like, there's a one guy that did the, the Twinkie diet, and I'm not sure if he did blood work as well, but um, there's been a lot of people that have been on really crappy diets, liquid shakes yeah. and whatnot, weight gainer stuff, uh, weight, weight watchers, weight losing stuff, uh, and they still ended up better. Mm. So you can have a really crappy diet and pure fasting, for sure, you'll be you'll be better off than if you were uh, obese, because the fat loss is just so much healthier yeah. than uh, any alternative. Yeah, and also like to kind of lose the fat faster, and uh, like the the idea of a slow and consistent caloric restriction isn't actually that good, 
because mm. you're gonna you're gonna stay fatter for longer, and uh, it, you, it will also cause more metabolic damage in the long term. Yeah, like I said, they, they, they just need to lose fat uh, immediately. So mm-hmm. there really isn't any. Uh, the longer you keep them obese, the the worse, the more damage it does. Yeah. So uh, it's also definitely not motivational. You can you can calculate the expected time it will take if you go uh, like super conservative, like people say, oh, you, you should stick to a five percent deficit or something. You can calculate based on that, just based on the thermodynamics, how long will it take to create the energy deficit needed to lose their you know, 20 kilos, 50 pounds or whatnot of fat. You're, mm-hmm. You can be talking about a year, two years yeah. of nonstop dieting before they're even in the healthy range. Yeah. That's, that, that prospect alone is, is uh, just maddening for many yeah. people. It's most people, most people will yeah, lose their interest and get bored in a sense. They, they, yeah. they don't see the results. And there's also research on this on dietary adherence that uh, also by meta-analysis that has confirmed this. People that lose fat, fat or weight, it, it studied, but it's basically fat. People that lose more fat in the initial phase of the diet, they're more motivated because they, they can see it works. And a lot of people, they have given up hope. I've had this with a lot of clients. They come to me and they're like, uh, they, they're basically desperate. And like, I've tried everything. If you can make me lose fat, then, you know, that, that's awesome. I, I just don't trust it anymore. Mm. And if you show them that it can be done, that is just a matter of good programming. They, you teach them exactly what they need to do and that gives them hope and that opens up everything. It's, it's a huge difference in mindset when they know uh, you get the results if you put in the work compared to, you know, they're, they're desperate and nothing works. Lose fat or die. In addition to that, then the person would still uh, have to engage in like heavy, heavy resistance training. So we, so we mentioned that, um, you know, protein and lifting weights is going to be the, the main uh, signaling factor for triggering muscle growth and uh, stimulating mm-hmm. the mTOR pathway and the things like that. So how, uh, how heavy would the person have to train in terms of kind of to make it happen? Um, the traditional idea used to be that there is this um, hypertrophy zone of like six to 12 reps that you have to stay in. Uh, but this is... Um, it never really made that much sense. It was probably mostly based on uh, feeling. Like if you lift a weight that's like 15 RM or lower, you don't feel it basically, at least the first reps. So that probably gave people the idea that it doesn't work. But it turns out that uh, the fatigue you accumulate over time, you do get uh, levels of muscle activation and fiber recruitment in the end of the set that you know the first reps are indeed ineffective basically. But later on in the set, you get similar levels of mechanical tension as you get with heavier weights. So it seems that actually, as long as you train close to failure, so um, you're training very hard and you're not leaving any reps in the tank or very few, then uh, you can go as low as about 30% of one RM, which corresponds to approximately your 30 RM. So weight you could lift 30 times, which is very, very light indeed. Um, But you have to go close to failure and there are some, uh, it induces a lot of fatigue and it's very mentally demanding. So a lot of people don't like it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in theory, you don't have to go that heavy. And you can also go super heavy if you want, as long as you get enough volume in, because muscles are basically there. Um, they just respond to tension. And as long as the tension is high enough, they will grow. And then it's the time of the tension basically that determines the magnitude of growth. Now, a super heavy weight will trigger very high levels of mechanical tension on the muscle fibers. There's very high force production required to lift the weight. But uh, the time of the tension is very small. If you do only like sets of two, then there's almost no time on attention. So there is not a lot. Um, you'd have to do a lot of extra sets to get the total time on the tension to a good enough level for maximum muscle growth. Mm. Uh, but in principle, they, they work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, that kind of a total volume and total uh, load can be basically, you know, spread out throughout the entire week and uh, the entire training cycle. Yeah. Uh, exactly. but how how how, lo- how long does the muscle building stimulus you know stay elevated after after working out? Uh, they, they usually say that it's the that protein synthesis is going to be elevated for like forty eight hours or something after mm-hmm. working out. Yeah, that's a bit of a bit of a conundrum in research at the moment because we have quite a lot of research on protein synthesis, muscle protein synthesis, and it shows that usually it's like 24, 48 hours. Um, there's some indication in untrained individuals of the, the stimulus lasting more than 72 hours, but basically the time you can elevate 
protein synthesis above baseline, which is so it's technically a delay in muscle fullness, researchers call it, basically the process of muscle growth. This is the time that you have that stimulus, and if you give your body protein, then it will ramp up protein synthesis and build that extra muscle tissue. Now it seems, based on that research, that this, this period lasts maybe three days or so. But we see in the research on training frequency that as long as you do enough volume, then you can stimulate um, so much growth that presumably you're growing the whole week because training frequency research shows that even if you do one session per week, which is what most traditional bro bodybuilders actually do, uh, you can actually get similar results, maybe not the same results in every research, but similar to training more frequently. So that's a bit of a, a contentious topic at the moment. I'm a proponent of higher frequency research because definitely based on the literature on muscle protein synthesis, as well as the, the general trend in the literature being that higher frequencies are better or equally effective. And there's only one study, which is a recent study. It's the first study ever that has ever found a statistically significant negative effect of higher versus lower training frequency, given the same total volume. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, there, I think a strong argument can be made that uh, it's most likely to be beneficial at worst neutral to train more frequently. But if you don't have a lot of time, uh, you only train a few times per week, then just make sure those sessions count, put a lot of volume in those, and it's not the end of the world for your gains. Mm. Yeah, and with, let's say, a higher frequency training routine would also mean that uh, you wouldn't overtax your muscles with one session all together. Like, for instance, if you, do it, if you train once a week, then you're going to burn yourself out <laughs> completely and mm. you're going to rest for the entire rest of the week, whereas like higher, higher frequency kind of keeps you uh, more, more, more in control or more careful with uh, the loads. Yeah, exactly. You have to separate between training frequency and volume. So a lot of people, when they hear of this new research on training frequency, the Norwegian Frequency Project and the like, uh, and a study between five and two that I posted on my blog, and they're like, oh, I'm going to try high frequency training. And then they just do, just do their program that they were doing before, like four days, and they start doing two extra days. So basically, they just add 50% volume all at once, and then they get injured and whatnot, and they're like, ah, high frequency doesn't work. Yeah. But you have to separate between the total volume, which is probably best measured by how many hard sets are you doing for a muscle group, and how often are you training a muscle group. Mm -hmm. So you can actually have like a high frequency program if you do four full body sessions, because most people will say stimulating a muscle group four times a week, that's high frequency. Uh, but it only requires only four sessions in the gym, which is, you know, for my kind of clientele, uh, not that much. Most, most of my clients train four, four to six times, uh, some seven as well, mm -hmm. uh, times per week. But what about like meal timing? Uh, if you do lift and your protein synthesis remains elevated for like, let's, the, the coming few days, then uh, how would you have to in, in implement like protein intake to, in, in, within that time frame? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. There's um, a few studies that have, sort of looked at this question, um, a few that have directly looked at it. And it's interesting that we have research showing that the, the anabolic window, the period of muscle protein synthesis increase post-training, uh, decreases as you get more advanced. And we also have a study showing that in untrained individuals, actually compared to bodybuilders, was uh, Nori et al. from uh, Japan, they um, found that the, the protein timing doesn't matter at all in untrained individuals, probably because that, that stimulus is going to be around for days. So, mm. you know, if you have your post workout shake immediately after the workout or four hours later, it doesn't matter. It's, it's like all within the same time frame, physiologically speaking. But for the bodybuilders, it actually came to a few hours. And there's a few other indications as well that suggest to me that you want to sort of mimic this curve of protein synthesis. Basically, you have to fuel. Um, the anabolic window. So the anabolic window is it's an anabolic window of potential, researchers sometimes call it. It doesn't mean you actually get that protein synthesis. You do have to fuel it. So I like to basically get give more protein in the periods after workouts, and especially mm -hmm. the period between the workouts and the evening. There's a few studies that have looked at this. Uh, if you have you wake up, you have to work out and you go to bed. And if you have most of the calories here, that gives poor results in a few studies than if you put shift the calories to post workout mm -hmm. in between the period of workout and bedtime. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of doing that and basically trying to uh, synchronize calories and protein with the anabolic window. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and uh, it's yeah, it's super. I also like to think that you know using protein for recovery and repair is probably much more important than taking it before that before you you have you have stimulated the muscle. So yeah, if yeah. let's say that's that goes back to the idea that you can build uh, muscle and lose fat at a deficit if you strategically time your protein uh, more carefully after the workout. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. That's, that's interesting. But let's, how, would, how would it change in some people who are doing the, like, intermittent fasting for like 16 or 20 hours a day or something like that? Uh, it, could, it could still work. Uh, I don't think fasted training is going to be optimal. There's actually a recent study uh, reviewed on Facebook about this. Uh, a pretty crappy study because it only had like five subjects, but it, uh, it strongly suggested at least that it was um, between a group training completely fasted and not having anything post-workout either, a group having just post-workout protein and a group having pre-workout protein, the group with the pre-workout protein actually had the best uh, training volume, the highest training volume, and the best muscle growth and strength development over time. Mm. And that's I think, makes a lot of sense. Uh, ideally, of course, you want both. Uh, it doesn't have to be super immediate, but you do want to sort of sandwich your workout between two meals. doesn't mean running down to the locker room, slamming down a protein shake. It uh, just means you want those amino acids in the blood. And if you have a, like a whole meal, uh, like steak or something, then those, those um, amino acids are going to be around for at least six hours generally. So no immediate rush. But you don't want to fuel that period. And you want to make right. sure that as soon as you are exercising, you want hyperamino acidemia. So elevation of amino acids in the blood. Yeah, so it's the mTOR you referred to earlier, it registers that signal. It basically integrates all the signals for muscle growth. Like, do we have amino acids? Um, do we have tension on the muscle fibers? Are growth factors active? Is this guy on gear? And it integrates all of that and sends it down to the nuclei, the cell cores for DNA. And there basically you have the blueprint to form your whole body. And that information is um, transcribed to the ribosomes. It's literally, it's like you have the blueprint, uh, it's translated and transcribed, goes to the ribosomes. And those are like the factories that create new proteins. Those make the proteins as per the blueprint. And that is the actual process of muscle growth and muscle protein synthesis. And that adds to the contractile tissue in the muscle. So you get bigger mm -hmm. muscles. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense that having all these sensors for mTOR in place, um, so the mTOR senses, you know, we have the stimulus and we have the means to build muscle, that it's all in place. Mm. Yeah, it's, I, I agree as well. Like, it is probably a better idea to have some amino acids in the blood before you train just to protect against uh, potential muscle catabolism and gluconeogenesis and uh, things like that. Yeah. Uh, but exactly. uh, uh, what, what about, like, let's say, BCAs? Then uh, how would, how would they, can they circumvent the need to actually eat protein? Uh, no, I think they can't. I think it almost always you're better off with just whole protein. Mm. Um, because what, what BCAs basically do is uh, leucine in particular, the other BCAs are well, sort of along for the right, but leucine is the, the star of the show. Yeah. Uh, leucine is like a signal that switches on mTOR. But it's like the analogy I like to use, it's like, it's like a light. Leucine is the switch. You try to turn on the light, but you also need electricity. Mm. So there's yeah. actually also a recent study that found that if you just consume leucine, you're, you're getting mTOR activation and uh, P76K, that whole anabolic signaling cascade is gonna be activated. But there's a bottleneck, the translation to the ribosomes because there, the anabolic signal is there, but there are no other amino acids yeah. to actually build muscle protein. Mm -hmm. So you actually don't get an increase in muscle protein synthesis. There are earlier studies thought that this was true because they saw mTOR increase. And normally mTOR increase is followed by protein synthesis, but that can only happen when you also have the other amino acids, otherwise they're the, the rate limiting step. Yeah, yeah it's, so it's. I think so yeah. almost always, even financially, you're better off buying weight than BCAs. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like uh, it's gonna be coming with with the actual building blocks as well, not just not just the construction workers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so in general, like for someone doing uh, any form of intermittent fasting or even like a regular diet, then they would have benefit from having slightly less protein before working out and kind of backloading more protein in the post-workout scenario than when the, yeah. when, the protein so you, when the protein synthesis is you know elevated exactly so and i think that in general if you look at like lean gains type intermittent fasting uh it has things right um not for the faster workouts in the bcas but it has things right in the 
in Martin Birkin's like normal setup where someone would basically train uh, or break the fast just before their training mm -hmm. and then have most or almost all of their calories of the day in between that window between bedtime and the workout. And that actually synchronizes nutrients very well yeah. with the anabolic window and protein synthesis. Uh, but if you place the workout like all the way in the morning and then you fast for 12 hours um, before you start eating, that's likely not ideal and BCAs are not going to help that. <laughs> it's gonna, only going to make more expensive urine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Very uh, but, expensive urine indeed. <laughs> but, 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 but what if you eat protein? Let's say you haven't worked out for like a week and uh, you haven't stimulated mTOR and uh, muscle protein synthesis. What happens with eating uh, protein in that window? Like how, was, how does the body respond? But will, will it still build muscle or? <laughs> yeah, you, well, muscle probably. Um, you can think of it as like a, a process that occurs all the time, all, all in both of our bodies right now, we have protein synthesis and breakdown, and it's the balance over time that determines whether there's actually loss of tissue or uh, gain of tissue. And if you haven't eaten for a long time and you have a high protein meal, you actually get a substantial increase in protein synthesis because the body's basically recovering the lean mass it lost. So it has the, sti it has the means and the stimulus in that case to build muscle, but if you don't have another high protein meal, and probably you're not going to build a lot of uh, muscle after that anymore. Um, but if you do a training session, now you have a huge stimulus for muscle growth. So now you can have many high protein meals and all of that will be used for muscle growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, the, the training stimulus is yeah, one of the most important factors for muscle growth. And uh, just, you know, although there are some people who, do, who take steroids without training, they're still going to grow muscle. It's, it's still not optimal for, you know, the regular people mm -hmm. to expect to build muscle without training heavy and uh, doing like compound lifts as well. Exactly. What, what researchers say is that nutrition is permissive. Mm. So the training is what actually causes and instigates muscle growth. It creates a stimulus. And nutrition is just there to see how much of the cup you can actually fill. So your nutrition alone never achieves much. Um, even if you, you, you bulk hard without training, you can actually gain a little bit of muscle mass, but there just isn't much of a stimulus for the body to build lean mass. Mm -hmm. So it will mostly just store it as fat. Because if you are a person that's untrained, your body basically faces the trade-off. We have a lot of excess energy. Are we going to store this as just body fat, which is a very efficient process? Uh, and it's it's just there. We can leave it there. It's like an, it's not an inert storage depot. It has hormonal functions and whatnot, and post tissue. But you know, mostly it's it doesn't do much and it's easy to maintain. Or do we build lean muscle mass, which is actually going to cost us a whole lot of energy, and then we have to maintain that lean mass as well, which is also energetically expensive. Mm -hmm. And if there's no obvious reason for the body to do that, then it will just choose to store fat. Right, right, yeah. But but let's say what 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 would happen if you uh, over consume protein? You mentioned that there is no benefit to eat above uh, one point six to one point eight grams per kilogram. Uh, but what mm -hmm. what happens if you do exceed that amount? Uh, it will usually be oxidized, uh, which means it basically contributes to fat gain, just like any other nutrients, mm -hmm. because it doesn't store the protein directly as muscle growth. That's very very energetically. Uh, inefficient, but you're you're never consuming just protein. Like right. I sometimes use protein refeeds for this purpose because in theory, if you eat nothing but protein, uh, or it's almost impossible. You're literally you're eating like supplements, chicken breast. Uh, it's not it's not the most tasty way to eat, <laughs> but uh, it can it can have its purpose once in a while, uh, especially after contest prep, I think. But then indeed, it's going to be extremely energetically inefficient for the body because it usually has to convert the amino acids to glucose first. And then glucose to fat, and that's mm -hmm. the the energy loss that occurs in all of these steps is is so massive that mm. I think uh, I'd have to check the figures, but I think it's going to be only 25% or so of your yeah. surplus that the body can actually store as fat. Mm. Now, normally, almost everyone has a mixed diet. You know, low fat, high fat. There is some fat in the diet. There are some carbs in the diet. Even ketogenic diet will have like 30, 50 grams of carbs often. Uh, you can go super low carb, but then even then there will be some carbs. So often what happens is the protein gets oxidized. So it's used as fuel basically for energy. And then the body has the fat that it now doesn't need to use for energy because it uses the protein for that and it stores the fat. So in the end, the end result is the same that 
if you over consume protein in energy surplus, you will actually get fat on that. Just like mm -hmm. if you over consume carbs or fat. Yeah. It's, it, well, it's not going to be the protein itself. It's going to be the glucose from the protein and, uh, and uh, the fat that it was going to end up with. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And, mo and mostly the, the other fat that uh, you were eating, but right. nonetheless, the protein contributes to the fat gain. Yeah, for sure. Did you take one of my protein bars? How, how, how much uh, protein and carbs and fat do you yourself eat at the moment? What, what's your like macro split or mm -hmm. something? Uh, I actually don't know my exact ratio. I know my protein intake is above 1.6 for sure, above 1.8, um, almost certainly. I eat at Libitum actually a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I go into contest prep or photo shoots, then in the last months I will uh, sharpen things up. And I've, I've tracked macros much of the time uh, when I was still gaining, but I think I'm pretty tapped out in terms of natural potential right now. So uh, I just eat at Libitum and that allows me to basically maintain my six pack year round, very convenient way for me to eat. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean you just eat whatever you want. Absolutely not. I eat actually super legit. If you compare me to, um, dare I say, most fitness professionals, um, mm -hmm. they don't really eat, eat, the, eat the talk, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm a big proponent of uh, lots of vegetables, healthy eating. Mm. Um, I almost always avoid starches because they just lead to overeating and fat gain for me. Mm. Uh, I actually have a huge appetite and uh, a normal metabolic rate, you could say. So if I start eating rice and uh, bread and whatnot, then I'll just very quickly get fat. Mm. Um, unless I track uh, my calories, but I don't want to do that. I just stick to, it's pretty paleo, but paleo with like uh, artificial sweeteners and dairy okay. and uh, right. um, pretty lean, healthy foods. And coffee. Whole foods. <laughs> yeah, and, and coffee. The, the the most common paleo food coffee everyone drinks <laughs> yeah uh, but uh, do you do like any intermittent fasting or something like that yeah i uh, i only eat two meals actually myself um so I, I do make sure that i sandwich my workout between those two meals so after this i'm actually gonna have my next meal and uh, i usually have my first meal then i work out and then uh, about six hours after the first meal i have my second meal which is the bigger one uh, it's like twice as big actually yeah. Um, in terms of calories and nutrients. So then I still have reasonable nutrient timing, I think. I don't think it's ideal to have only two meals if someone is interested in maximum muscle growth and it's not yet very advanced. So they can actually still you know, ramp up muscle protein surfaces around the clock. But for me, uh, right now I think I'm you know, basically just maintaining if there's some muscle to gain, I'm happy to do it very slowly. Based on my measurements, I gain less than a pound of muscle a year at the moment. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a slow process. Yeah, I think like yeah, that kind of that kind of intermittent fasting with two meals and uh, and uh, relatively higher protein uh, is kind of really good for like very lean lean uh, progressive increase in in body body mass. So yeah, I think it's it works wonders for most people. Uh, but what 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 do you have any specific training goals in the near future or? Not really. Um, I usually set like sub goals, like my phone squat or whatnot. Um, I've, you know, most strength goals I think I've uh, fit. Uh, just try to uh, stay injury free. Um, I still do all like the compound lifts. I do a lot of variation. Uh, do stuff like trying to set a zero squat PR, those kind of things to keep you motivated and, um, you know, get, get give some goal because I think bench press goals and the like. Uh, um, I, I only way for me to beat those goals would be to uh, get at a higher body weight first and then. Uh, but then it's not a real PR, basically, relative to body weight. So um, I've basically done all of those cycles at least three times over, maxing out on the bench press. And you know, sometimes I get like a few pounds over the previous PR. But uh, I think the reality for me is I'm pretty much at my, my netting max, as they call it. <laughs> so, mm, so in the maintenance but phase. That's, but that's, I mean, that's after um, almost 16 years of training. So. Wow, that's, that's amazing, yeah. And uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you're, you're kind of rebranding your uh, website and uh, moving on to like a personal brand and something. But uh, mm -hmm. I believe like you also at the moment uh, provide like personal training and uh, some cert cert certificates as well on your website. Can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do um, um, the same stuff I was doing as patient bodybuilding. So my two, two main things I do is I work on my PT courses 
that are uh, online PT course, actually certification programs. Um, basically try to do, provide the stuff that actually teaches people how to be good PTs and get results in clients because most mainstream uh, fitness certifications, you know, they're, they're nice to put on your resume, but that's really it, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, coaching, of course, I still do coaching. That's how I started. Uh, it all um, began for me actually when I was still a business consultant. Um, those are the two main things I do. I don't really have any products actually at all at the moment, uh, but I'm writing a book on uh, the science of self-control that will mm. be out. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes in the future. Sometime, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, but where can people learn more about your work and uh, your future projects? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, my name and I'm, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Facebook's probably best if you like scientific references and stuff, because Twitter is like, <laughs> I run out of characters writing everything, and Instagram, you can post links, which is really annoying if you want to scientifically reference your work. Mm -hmm. uh, so Facebook's probably best if you have that. Uh, but yeah, I'm on, I'm on all those mediums, and on menowensomons.com, you can uh, find everything I publish, basically. Awesome. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, and uh, I believe like a lot of people gained some awesome information about how to actually build muscle and uh, lose fat at the same time. So, but but, but before I let, but before I let you go, I want to ask my last question, which is, uh, what would be this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? One piece of advice. Um, that's tricky. For me, at least, one of the the, the big things. Um, in terms of at least physique, maybe not productivity and the like. Um, actually, I'll, I'll focus on a bigger one, uh, like productivity and everything, is um, organize your life. Actually, this is the one piece of advice. It's, it's the most uh, important advice of everything. Organize your life, your life so that you maximize uh, well-being and happiness. That's like where welfare economics, uh, the whole principle of uh, utility theory and economics, mm -hmm. psychology, everything converges. Uh, healthier people live longer, healthier people, um, or happier people are healthier, happier people live longer, actually, even controlling for uh, physical health. Um, in general, happier people can push themselves harder in the gym, have better self-control, an easier time sticking to their diet. Happier people just are just better versions of ourselves. So uh, if there's one piece of advice I can give everyone is try to be happy. And that is, I think, uh, the key to making the most out of yourself. Yeah. That's, that's amazing advice and uh, being happier yourself will make the society a better place as well. So <laughs> every, everyone, exactly. would be, everyone would be happier then. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And uh, thank you for coming to the podcast again and uh, looking forward to your work in the future. Thanks. My pleasure. That's it for this episode of the Body, Mind and Power podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on the iTunes or the other social media platforms. Definitely check out the show notes for the topics that we discussed in this episode. Thanks for listening. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.